Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg, and uh, we're doing our Walking in the Word series. And uh, we have finished up the Samuel Scrolls. We've gone very quickly through Saul and David, and uh, we have left the Samuel Scroll. David has, has died and has left uh, the throne to his uh, son uh, Solomon, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because we're going to be talking about two more scrolls, the King's Scroll and the Chronicles Scroll. Now, the King's Scroll and the Chronicles Scroll kind of run parallel to each other. Um, they talk about the history of Israel up to and including the exile and even a little bit about the return from the exile. Um, but they do it in very different ways. Um, so I'm going to put a chart up and as you can see there's some there's some comparisons we can make between Kings and Chronicles. So Kings started before the exile and finished at the beginning of the Judean exile. Whereas in Chronicles it was started during the Judean exile and finished after we returned. Now I'm talking about when it was written. So Kings was started to be written before Israel was exiled um, to Assyria and Babylon. And Chronicles, started, the writing started while they were in exile and was finished after they got back. Kings is an extension of Samuel, whereas Chronicles is standalone. Kings starts with the end of David's life Chronicles starts with a series of genealogies leading up into kind of a sanitized version of David's life. Although the sense of sin is present in chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles, um, really it's a, it's, it's a sanitized version of David's life. There's no Bathsheba sin. There's no um, talk about the rebellions that happened. Kings reads like a narrative. So much like Samuel uh, read, uh, whereas Chronicles reads sort of like official court documents. Kings omits David's part in the building of the temple, whereas Chronicles details David's part in preparing and, and, and preparing Solomon for building the temple. Kings, the focus is on the northern kings and the prophets Elijah and Elisha, Whereas in Chronicles, the focus is on Judah's kings with some narrative on the prophets. Lastly, Kings includes the Assyrian exile of the northern kingdom, as well as Judah's exile from the southern kingdom. Chronicles includes only Judah's exile to Babylon, plus a short narrative on the return. All right. So that's Kings and Chronicles. Let's pick up, and I'm going to continue with the story, and just remember that Kings and Chronicles run parallel, so I'm going to be referring to both of them over this next little bit. It, David dies, and there's a play for who's going to succeed David as king. Adonijah, who is David's oldest son, and is Absalom's younger brother. Remember, Absalom was killed when he rebelled against David. Adonijah prepares to be king, but he ostracizes Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet was the one who exposed David's sin with Bathsheba. David was, uh, sorry, Nathan was a very godly man. He uh, was a true prophet and that he spoke the word of God. And for Adonijah to ostracize Nathan was not a good idea. Bathsheba and Nathan kind of conspire to make David's younger son, his youngest son Solomon, king. I want to read for you 1 Kings uh, 1. And uh, we're going to start at verse 15. And I want you to listen clearly to how the narrative 
sort of describes the scene of making Solomon king. And this is before David has died. Okay, so David's very, very old. He's, he's getting ready to die. Bathsheba went to the king and in his bedroom, and since the king was very old, Abishag the Shuamite was attending to him. Bathsheba knelt low and paid homage to the king and asked, what do you want? She replied, and he asked, what do you want? She replied, my lord, since you swore, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, your son Solomon is to become king after me, and he is the one who is to sit on my throne. Now look, Adonijah has become king, and my lord king, you didn't know it. He has lavishly sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep, and he's invited the king's sons, the priest Abathar, and Joab, the commander of the army. But he did not invite your servant Solomon. Now, my lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. Otherwise, when my lord, the king, rests with his ancestors, I and my son Solomon will be regarded as criminals. At that moment, while she was still speaking, the king, with the king, the prophet Nathan arrived. See? Bathsheba and Nathan. And it was announced to the king, the prophet Nathan is here. He came into the king's presence and paid homage to him with his face to the ground. My lord the king, Nathan said, did you say Adonijah is to become king after me? And he is the one who's to sit on my throne? For today he went down and lavishly sacrificed oxen, fat, and cattle, and sheep. He intended all the sons of the king, the commanders of the army, and the priest Abathar. And look, they're eating and drinking in the presence and in his presence, and they're saying, Long live King Adonijah. But he did not invite me, me, your servant, the priest, or the priest Zadok, or Benaniah, or these other folks, or Solomon. I'm certain my Lord King would not have this happen without letting your servant know. Who will sit on the king's throne after him. So nowhere before this do we hear that David has promised the throne to Solomon. Are they taking advantage of his old age? Maybe. Did he promise the throne to Solomon and it just wasn't written down? Kind of doubtful. Kind of doubtful. This would have been written down. Um, but it's possible. Look, here's the thing. David makes Solomon king after this. Solomon has Adonijah killed. And in chapter 2, David gives his last words of wisdom to Solomon. He instructs him on how to be king but he kind of ruins it by telling him how to kill all of his enemies, internal enemies. David then dies, and we're gonna to go to 1 Kings chapter two, and I wanna read something really quick for you here, verses 10 and 12. David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, Jerusalem. The length of time David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. And Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingship was firmly established. All right. Solomon is now king. And we're going to move into Solomon now. So 1 Kings 3 and 2 Chronicles 1 re recounts the story of how God visits Solomon and Solomon is given an opportunity to ask whatever he wants from God. And what does Solomon ask for? Wisdom. He's given wisdom. But God says, you know, you could have asked for riches, you could have asked for a powerful nation kingdom, but you asked for something that's internal, wisdom. And when we get to the wisdom literature, we're going to talk a lot about what that really means. But what we can see is that Solomon is starting off, like his father David, 
as a man after God's heart. He wants to know who God is and what God wants for the nation. God instructs Solomon to build a temple, a house for him in Jerusalem. So second, so first Kings four through seven and second Chronicles three through four, uh, all talk about building up the temple. 1 Kings 8 through 9 and 2 Chronicles 5 through 7 talk about the dedication of the temple. And this is really important because some things happen here that are remarkable. 1 Kings 8, 3 through 11 and 2 Chronicles 5, 2 through 12 talk about the glory cloud of the Lord resting into the temple. It's the same as Exodus 40, 16 through 38, where the glory cloud rested on the tabernacle in the wilderness. The presence of God enters into the temple. And after all this, after all of this, and Solomon has witnessed all this, he's received the gift of wisdom, we see the decline of Solomon. And Solomon's decline is far worse than David's, even though the kingdom is flourishing, even though Israel has never been stronger, even though all of his enemies have been vanquished. Solomon's decline is far worse than David's. Solomon was in a place of comfort, and a lot of times a place of comfort, a place of laziness, draws from us a lazy attitude towards God. Solomon commits the sin of slavery. Part of building up the kingdom is he, he starts collecting many slaves. He commits sin of idolatry and adultery. He has 700 wives. Now, these marriages are usually political alliances. But all of these wives are pagan wives, bringing their pagan idols. He has 300 concubines, women that he's sleeping with. Solomon completely disregards Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. And I encourage you to go back and read that. Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20, because if you remember, that was the instruction God gave to Moses before there were any kings of Israel. He gave these instructions. These are how the kings are to behave. And Solomon completely throws that away. His father David pretty much threw that away too. But Solomon does it in grand style. So this sinful turn by Solomon is actually not recorded in Chronicles. It just tells about the greatness of Solomon's reign. Solomon eventually dies, and his son, Rehoboam, becomes king. This is where we're going to get into a period of time in Israel's history called the Divided Kingdom. So Rehoboam becomes king, and this is in 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles 10. All right? In 1 Kings 11, Jeroboam, who's this other fellow, participates in an assassin, assassination attempt against Solomon. So Jer, this guy named Jeroboam is banished to Egypt. He, he escapes and flees to Egypt. Now Solomon dies and Jeroboam comes back. After Solomon's death, he asks Jeroboam, asks Rehoboam, now the king, to lighten the load on the people of Israel because Solomon has put a really heavy burden on these people in building up these cities, building all these building projects. So Rehoboam decides that he's going to ask his advisors, what should I do? So he goes to the older uh, wise advisors and say, what should I do? And they tell him, lighten the load. Make the people love you. If they love you, they'll follow you. 
And Rehoboam goes, okay. And then he went to his younger advisors and said, what should I do? And they said, give them twice as much work. Make them fear you. Which group did, he, did Rehoboam listen to? The younger one. Rehoboam listened to the younger advisors and makes things harder for the people of Israel. Jeroboam then leads a civil war against Rehoboam and the kingdom divides with Judah and Benjamin to the south and the rest of the kingdoms now called Israel. Now, this gets really kind of confusing because we've been referring to Israel as this entire nation. Now Israel is referred to as the Northern Kingdom. So I'm going to, as much as I can, refer to Israel as the Northern Kingdom and Judea, Judah, and Benjamin by default, because Benjamin's right in the middle of Judea, as the Southern Kingdom. Jeroboam leads the civil war and he set and Jeroboam sets up two capitals in the northern kingdom, Shechem and Penuel. Uh, he also sets up two centers of worship. One is in Bethel and one is in Dan. Remember, Dan's in the north now. He institutes Baal and Ashtoreth worship, which is the worship of bull and calf idols. So if you go to Tel Dan, and I'll show a picture here of Tel Dan, and where there was a, a center of idolatry and an idol um, altar, uh, pagan altar, um, Jeroboam is leading the northern kingdom into pagan idolatry. And one of the features of the northern kings is that all of them were pagans. All of them were idol worshipers. We also hear about these things called the high places. Uh, these were hills and monuments and villages where idols would be set up to either Baal or Astra. And um, it's here that we need to talk about the main Canaanite gods. So Baal, um, he came from the territory of Dan and is the god of fertility and land and humans. Um, you know, I'm going to show you a picture here of a cave that's up in, um, in Caesarea Philippi. And uh, this is where uh, supposedly Baal came out and they, would call, they called this place the gate of hell or the gate of the dead where Baal came out of. Later, there was a temple to uh, Pan there, and right next to it was a temple to Zeus. And uh, when we get to the Gospels, that's going to play an important part in, in one of uh, Jesus' narratives. But um, Baal is this god of fertility, of the land, of growing and agriculture. Asherah is the female equivalent to Baal, and she's concerned with sex, reproduction, and war. There's also another god, a main god, a god named Molech, who's worshipped. And Molech demands child sacrifice. See, they're going back to the old Canaanite gods. And that was one of the reasons why God destroyed the Canaanites, was because of child sacrifice and their worship of Molech. So I'm going to leave us here. Jeroboam is leading the northern kingdom into idolatry and pagan worship. What happens? Let's find out next week. So until then, this is Greg. Chaplain Greg, you're a uh, wandering Wesleyan. If you are enjoying this series, please like and subscribe. And uh, I will see you next week. Be blessed.